through a number of those doors, going to the beach every summer weekend. I've been stung by jellyfish, pulled down by tidal rips, almost stood on a, on a stonefish at one point. But a visit to um, Vic Hislop's Shark Museum in Harvey Bay in the mid-80s put an end to my desire to go to the beach, and I survived, and I'm here today. Um, I'm pleased today to present Dr Jonathan Richards, who will delve into that darker side of the Queensland coastline, discussing fatalities on Queensland beach, beaches and coastal waterways between 1880 and 1960. Jonathan's a lecturer, lecturer in Australian history at the School of Humanities, Griffith University, and he specialises in the morbid field of archival research into violence and death in Queensland. He's the author of the acclaimed The Secret War, <laughs> A True History of Queensland's Native Police, a copy of which, of course, we have up in the John Oxley Library. Um, following the presentation by Jonathan today, there'll be an opportunity at the end for audience questions. Uh, please note that there are audio, we're producing an audio recording of this talk as well that will go up on, onto our website. Um, just one bit of housekeeping. If you do need to go to the toilet or leave at any point, there are exits at both sides and the toilets are just outside the doors to this section. Um, and if you have a mobile phone with you, if you could uh, turn it off now, that would be good. Please welcome Dr Jonathan Richards. Thank you, Simon. Can you all hear me? Yes? Good? OK. I've never used one of these before, so I'll have to remember I don't need to talk so loudly. Thank you all for coming. It's great to have an audience. Thank you to Louise Danoon for inviting me to come and do this presentation today. Um, I begin, as always, with a number of acknowledgements. I acknowledge the rightful owners of the country on which we meet today. I also wish to acknowledge the rightful owners of the beaches on which my story today is based. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the guidance and assistance I've had from two really distinguished historians, Professor John Weaver from McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, and Professor Mark Fanane at Griffith University. Both those scholars took me out to the archives, taught me how to research and how to make history out of it. So I'm indebted to both those men. And of course, the last acknowledgement, and I hope you'll join me in a, a silent prayer, all the people who died so I could tell you a story. Because without their deaths, there would have been no records and I wouldn't have anything to talk about. I would have had something, had to find something else. So, let's begin with Death at the Beach. This is a work in progress. Based on about 10 years research in the inquest records at the Queensland State Archives. And all the photos that I use in this talk are taken from the archives photo collection. So I just had a quick look to see photos that would talk about the beach. Um, two things. I'm not a gal, OK? I research violence and death because I think it's really interesting. You learn so much about people's lives from the circumstances of their deaths. Inquest files at the Queensland State Archives are one of the most complete records of deaths held anywhere <coughs> in the world. Okay? Much better than are held in other Australian states and much better than in many other countries throughout the world. We have inherited this curious centralised record keeping system from our colonial days and it means I have been able to systematically go through about 100 years worth of inquests. I've looked at something like 50,000 deaths. I've chosen just to concentrate today on the period from 1890 through to 1960. It is a work in progress. I would love to take it further and given the time, I will. But as I go out to the archives one day a week, and it can take you probably half a day to go through a bundle, as those of you who've done research will know, it is a really slow, time-consuming business. I'm really grateful that I have found employment at Griffith University in the School of Humanities that allows me to keep on doing that. 
Now, the second thing I'd like to talk about before I begin is about the beach, okay, and why I think beaches are so important in Australian history. And I begin by saying that non-Indigenous history in Australia begins by the sea, whether it be Circular Quay or Redcliffe or straight across the river from where we are now, the first Europeans arrive by boat. And for many, many years, that is how people come to Australia. In fact, I would say up until the 1950s, the vast majority of boat people who came to Australia did so by ship. So for nearly all of us, somewhere in our genetic background, there is this connection of that place where land and sea meet. Okay? One of the things that is absolutely fascinating is when the convicts and the settlers first came here, not too many of them could swim. Okay? It was not a really common skill. I'm astonished at the number of seamen who drowned because they couldn't swim. Shipwrecks were a huge cause of death in colonial society. The first thing that they noticed was these Aboriginal people swimming in Sydney Harbour. The convicts started copying that. And I'll have to look at this to check my date. They banned swimming in the daytime from 1833. And 1830, from 1838, it was illegal to swim in the daytime anywhere in Australia, or as it was then, it was New South Wales. In the meantime, back in Europe, the whole idea of going to the seaside had become popular. So on the one hand, you've got this ban on swimming, and at the same time, you've got the, the, particularly the aristocracy and the monarchy going off to the beaches for their, their holidays. And we inherited a very curious mix of English law in Australia that has given us public access to beaches. And I don't think, I don't think we appreciate how rare that is and, and what a, a wonderful thing that is, that surveyors were given instructions to leave land clear on beaches for an esplanade and for public access, which is why we have... You just walk onto the beach. It's our great democratic right in Australia. It doesn't happen in other parts of the world, OK? So there's, there's a, you know, one of the reasons why we get a beach culture emerging. From 1902, daytime bathing is legalised in Australia, OK? And we get the first surf life-saving clubs established in the first decades of the 20th century. So from then on, the whole beach culture in Australia really kicks off. And there's some wonderful <coughs> stories there. There's debates as to who was the first lifesavers. I like the fact that they actually decided that it was better to have mixed bathing so the men could rescue the women when they got into trouble. You know, they'd had these sort of rigid, uh, sexually demarcated beaches. They still do. I mean, if you go down to Coogee, there's still a women's baths, for example. And, of course, the, uh, the whole eugenics movement in the 1920s means that going to the sea is regarded as a, a healthy thing for the white race to do, you know. Artists and writers have been very slow to pick up on this. I actually think that the beach is the dominant theme in Australian history. You can keep your wars and the bush and all the rest of it. I think if you actually ask overseas people what defines Australia, quite apart from Indigenous culture, they'll say it's the beach. All right? Australians, we grow up, we go to the beach as families, we get burnt, we have the highest rate of skin cancer in the world in Queensland, all courtesy of this wonderful outdoor lifestyle. And going to the beach is an integral part of that. OK, so just to finish that off, um, the beach is, I think, a really important theme in Australian history. I think it's been neglected. All right. In the process of working for these two professors, I looked at all these inquests, looking at other things, particularly looking at violence. And along the way, I thought, oh, I wonder how many of these surf drownings I can collect. This is the the product of, of what I've found. 
I also looked at shark attacks. I was particularly interested in any inquest into crocodile fatalities. But I really began looking at stingers. All right? I really wanted to know about jellyfish and marine stingers. <coughs> Because they're, you know, pretty unique to Queensland. You don't get them too many other places. And actually, it turns out there's very few of those. Now, just very generally, this is not every beach and this is not every fatality at a beach in Queensland. This is just a very brief overview. There are a lot of beaches where one person drowned. I've left them out, OK? There are places like Torres Strait, where there are large numbers of deaths from shark attack. But most of them are people out on boats, OK? They're not actually on the beach. I haven't included shipwrecks, obviously, and I haven't included people who fell off boats and drowned. There's another hundred or more deaths, OK? And I have not included what I consider to be a deliberate or suicidal drowning. And sad to say, it is one of the most common causes of suicide, uh, sorry, cause, ways of committing suicide in Queensland. And the Brisbane River actually is the, the top venue for jumping in the water. People do walk out, at, out to sea, okay? But I've left them out. The beaches that are here, beginning with Southport, and I'll just get my very detailed list. Does not mean this is the worst beach, okay? It just means more people go to Southport, all right? Don't forget Southport is one of our very earliest seaside resorts. So from the 1880s, there are people going there for holidays. Um, 1890, those two men, they were brothers, okay? So, you know, whether one got into trouble, the other drowned trying to save him. The licensee of the Main Beach Hotel, his son tried to actually rescue them. So all these people give evidence at these inquests. You get great insights into how do people get to the beach? Who do they go with? What time of day are they going there? Where do they come from? Can they swim? All that kind of stuff. 1905, a family of six drowned. Now, I've counted that one as, as there because I suspect they were there for a seaside holiday, OK? Whereas there's a lot of other marine drownings as well. The 1909 case is a tourist from Victoria, and I think he's the first I've found. So I was really fascinated to know how many of them were locals or how many of them were Queenslanders and how many were, were tourists as well. So, you know, it just keeps going. Three men, one man, and on to the next slide. The 1924 one is a Boy Scout uh, at Southport, and he actually drowns in the channel. So I suspect that's a scout camp. Scout camps do actually, those kinds of activities do produce deaths. Um, the 1932 one, I actually have never found that inquest but his mother committed suicide by drowning herself at Breakfast Creek. And she actually said, my son has drowned at Southport. The body was never found. Now, that raises all sorts of questions about whether there was a, an inquest or not. The one from 1936 is one of the ones that really sticks in my mind. I'm working my way through the inquest bundles, year by year, bundle by bundle, file by file. And I open this file up and there is a torn piece of cloth in that bundle. And it was the man's bathers. And they said in the inquest they were brand new. He only bought them. That was the first time he had worn them. The inquest concluded that he had been drowned, but the body was never found. All that was found was these ripped togs. And they said, well, we think a shark got him as well. That really spooked me, that one. But at the same time, I thought, how utterly fascinating to find something like in an inquest bundle. 1937, uh, quite a few there. There's a um, Lifesavers, finally, 
right, by the, the late 30s. And that's something else that I'd like to explore. There's a, there's a great wealth of archival material on Lifesavers. Moving through the 1930s, 1943 soldiers drowning, okay? And we get this on a number of beaches as well, all right? And from then on, though, particularly from the war, it's overwhelmingly men, okay? And it's not just men who drown, it's men who get taken by sharks as well. And I'm fascinated by that. Are the men swimming out further? Are they swimming at different times of the day? Um, why, why do sharks prefer men to women? Okay, yeah, Do they taste better or something? And I love, you know, I mean, these images just make me weep, you know, that you could just drive down to the beach and park on the headland in your uh, touring car, you know. Nothing, nothing new in this world, is there? That's 80, 80 years ago. Here's your number two, Townsville. I'll tell you what, I go to Townsville every year. I've give, pretty much given up swimming there ever since I found out about this. I've always said the archives have ruined my holidays. Um, Ross Craig, don't go near it. Don't even put your finger in the water up there. And that's the, the, the greatest number of shark deaths at any one point in Queensland. And I suspect it was the meatworks. Okay? And young men full of bravado and testosterone. Oh, I'm not scared of sharks. Whoops. We do know that even in the early years of Townsville, there were a number of Aboriginal children taken by sharks and possibly by crocodiles in Ross Creek. I think Aboriginal people had traditionally swum there, but once the meatworks was established from the 1870s, I think that is what brought in the, the killers. OK, what else have we got? Oh, Kissing Point. Anyone been to Kissing Point? Anyone know Townsville? OK, it's got a shark-proof enclosure built by the CWA in the 1930s. Sharks got in. OK, which, you know, is really not surprising because they have stinger-proof enclosures in North Queensland now. The northern beaches from Cairns, the crocodiles have worked out how to get up on the booms and sunbake and watch the tourists. I think it's wonderful. You know, every time humans come up with an adaptation so we can survive in their environment, things like sharks and crocodiles, I mean, these are just killing machines. All right? They're just lethal. OK. What else have we got? Oh, stinger death. OK. The fascinating thing about stingers is how few there were before World War II. Okay, and I asked an Aboriginal friend of mine in Cairns, I said, George, how come you people didn't get stung? He said, nobody told us we were supposed to get stung. Even though they were in and out of the water all day long. There is a suggestion that farming and, you know, the runoff from farms is in some ways connected with an explosion of stinger numbers. There certainly were not stingers. It might be that not as many people swam before the war as well. But certainly from World War II, you do get stinger deaths in North Queensland. And of course, what started me on this whole project is the number of stinger deaths on the beaches north of Cairns and the name that was adapted for that particular species of jellyfish is Irukandji. The local Aboriginal tribe are the Irukandji people. And the expert who named them, he said, well, that's a good name for a, a deadly marine animal. We'll name it after an Aboriginal tribe. I won't say any more about that. But as you can see, there's, there's quite a few stinger deaths in the Townsville area. And there's also these tragic deaths in this shark-proof swimming enclosure. I, I just think, I can't imagine anything worse. You go up there thinking, oh, yeah, this is all good. I'll go for a swim. The shark gets there before you. As you can see, 1930, you know, beaches are really popular, OK? They're, they're packed out. I mean, people go there for a, a holiday. They spend all day there. What I love, of course, is the, um, the lack of undress, you know, that you do keep your clothes on. Because in the late 1930s, the greatest issues that local government had to deal with 
with regard to bathing in public was men going topless. Okay, letter after letter. You can't have half-naked men walking around the streets. Where's it all going to end? Men walking around with just a bit of cloth around their waist? And I thought, gee, if they had a time machine and they could come forward now, they would be shocked, wouldn't they? But, um, yeah, I mean, archives, we, there's a, a wonderful collection of those photos. Other end of the coast, OK? Coolangatta, Tugan, Kira. OK? Nearly all drownings, OK? So it's a steady time, but it's a bit later than Southport. So even though Coolangatta itself is actually really old and there is a train line there, I think it takes a little bit longer for the crowds. I know that the railways used to run special excursions, even from Ipswich. You know, there'd be sort of eight trains a day down to Coolangatta. So there would be big influxes of people at certain times of the year. But like I say, from the 1930s onwards, there are surf lifesavers. There's actually competition between surf lifesaving clubs to get contracts to patrol beaches. And I have a suspicion there were more surf lifesavers than there were beaches. Right? So they're actually arguing with each other. Where it says a man died in the surf, I've also included you know, men who died of heart attacks and you know, cerebral haemorrhages and strokes and things like that. And men get, you know, and it's usually men, get dumped by a big wave. And that's it, they're uh, not able to get out. But, you know, you'll see that uh, not so many sharks down the southern end, so that's probably a good place to go if you're worried about sharks, OK? And, um, you know, I mean, that could really be any time, couldn't it? You know, having, having a good time, a family on a beach, sprawling in front of a camera, what changes, OK? Moreton Bay and Islands. There's still, you know, there's a lot more in, in Moreton Bay itself, OK? There's a lot of people fall off boats. There's a lot of sailboats capsize. In fact, that's probably a whole other talk on its own. It's just uh, accidental drownings in Moreton Bay. Obviously, Point Lookout, right, which is where I used to go as a teenager, is not a real good place to go. If you're not competent in the surf, okay, a lot of people drown. Sometimes they, they're swimming at night, which is really asking for trouble. The other thing that you do get in places like that are people slipping off rocks. Okay, that also happens in other places as well. But, you know, you still get you know, a few Redland Bay places like that. And these four girls, I just, I, I'm sorry, and I'm not an ogling old man, but I just think they're gorgeous. And I really think, you know, that's 1931. I reckon I saw, saw those girls at Woodford last year. <laughs> <laughs> or their granddaughters, <laughs> because I think fashion is just like that. It'll just keep coming back. Now, this really surprised me. You know, I'd always sort of, you know, you think, oh, Redcliffe, Sandgate, yeah, you know, it's pretty safe, sheltered, it's in Moreton Bay, it's got the islands... No, it's actually a really scary place. And again, it's overwhelmingly men. You know, you get a few women and children mixed in, but men seem to, even, you know, placid beaches, they can drown. Here's that family still having fun. I like the way they're, they're right on the edge of the water. It's almost as they're looking out to see if there's a shark or, or a lifeguard. And here we go, here's the, um, you know, I, I'd say this really does go with Southport, the north end of the, of the Gold Coast, okay? Or as I, I'm sorry, I prefer to refer to it as the South Coast because historically it was known by that for a lot longer than it's been the Gold Coast. Um, yeah, mix of men and women and only one shark attack. That's one of the really late shark attacks that then leads into the whole thing about um, shark netting, meshing, shark killing, which is still going on okay, along the Gold Coast. It's probably one of the reasons there hasn't been a 
nearly as many shark fatalities in recent years. That actually began in the 1970s. Huge number of other marine animals get killed in those nets. So, so. There's always a, you know, a bad side to it. The surf lifesavers, all right? You know, this, is, this is 31, all right? So they, they're getting organised, all right? They've got carnivals, that they're being trained. Um, again, that's another... I don't think we've got a really good history of surf lifesaving in Australia, I and mean, I'd, I'd like to see that there was one. This surprised me. You go to Bundaberg and, you know, you're inside the reef, or nearly... 1770 onwards, there's no more surf. The girl who drowned at Sand Hills is one of the most distressing cases in all of the inquests I've ever seen. A group of young girls were bathing, and this is in 1890, right? And girls in those days were probably pretty modest. A group of boys came on the beach, and this girl refused to leave the water while there were boys there. She drowned. And I thought, you know, drowning for the sake of your modesty is really a terrible, terrible waste of a life. So that Sandhills place is actually, in the early days, is quite dangerous. But again, you know, you look at the places, if you go up to there to Bundaberg, to those beaches, you think, how could you drown here? But there are worse. Oh, here's the lifesavers off to on the rescue. This is the one that amazed me. And Simon, when you talk about central Queensland, how on earth do you drown at your pone? You have to walk a kilometre to get to water up to your waist. It's the shallowest beaches in central Queensland. All right? There's a huge tidal variation and there are some deep channels. All right? But what you start getting here are non-swimmers. I don't understand that. What's a non-swimmer doing in the water? I mean, it's kind of, you know, no-brainer, really. You're going to drown. But it's, it's not just your poon. Well, it's also Emu Park, OK? The next, of, next beach south, just, south uh, just east of Rocky, OK? Same again, non-swimmers. Right? People, country people on holidays, they go to the seaside, get in the water, they drown in three foot of water, a metre sometimes. And then you get you know, the tragedies like the two boys and unfortunately that is unbelievably common. The number of creeks and waterholes and rivers where two or more children in a family drown and you Having, you know, this happened to me when I was young. My younger brother got into trouble in the water and I went to save him. And you can understand what happens. Um, you know, these sort of things probably affect families for a very, very long time. Check that out. This is how you go on a, a South Coast holiday in 1933. That's New Year's Day. You know, put your tent up. I love the absence of motor cars. You know, the tents are, are right beside each other. Where are the cars? How do they all get there? <laughs> and look at the crowd on the beach. Lifeguards have been, surf lifesavers were in flat out that day. But it really does take you back to another time, doesn't it? It really takes you back to where people were totally happy to go on that sort of a holiday. That was normal. And this is 1933, okay? So this is really showing how beach culture is just part of our lifestyle. Caloundra. Again, you know, you'd think, oh, that's a safe place. Yeah, and the surf's not too wild, it's not too exposed. You, people drown in pumice stone passage, for goodness sake. I even had one there where a bloke was trying to walk across Pumice Stone Passage to Bribey for a bet. He didn't make it. I wonder if that many had to pay up. Soldiers, OK? And again, I, you know, I, could, I could pursue that more. 1934, we, we, we're starting to get development down the south coast, all right? 
there is, you know, there's this great correspondence. Nobody wants to go and live by the beach. It's a mosquito-infested swamp. Why would you want to live there? The, the woman and her two sons were actually on a, on a boat in the creek and the, the um, boat capsized. They were washed out by the tide. Bodies were never found, presumed taken by sharks. Okay, so even in the middle of the coast. Again, you know, 1940, we're coming up to war, but, <laughs> and there are actually posters saying, uh, you know, it's fun on the beach, but you should be doing your bit for the war. Maruchidor. Now, I grew up believing that was a safe beach. I really did think that that part of the north coast, I thought, oh, yeah, no, you can't get into trouble there. You know, 1906, a little bit behind the south coast, but you've still got drownings there. And I am indebted to my colleague Tracy for alerting me to the fact that I had left out the two boys and a girl who were killed on the beach there when the shark plane crashed. The two people in the plane survived. And I said, that's not a, that's not a, um, a beach death. And she said, they died on a beach. <laughs> the, they went there for a nice, pleasant day at the beach. They just happened to get hit by a plane, not by a shark. So I went, oh, OK, I'll include that one. Um, and I notice, courtesy of Tracy, that there is now an um, efforts being made f to erect a memorial to those three children who died. And that, that is a real tragedy, that one. Jumping forward here a little bit, see the fashions, you know, men can now go to the beach topless. I don't know about if they can go anywhere else. I, I, I just laughed and laughed when I saw that. Of all the things for councils to be worried about. You know, back to the Gold Coast, still, you know. It's, it's really basically all along the South Coast. You probably shouldn't swim anywhere between Southport and Curlingatta. I'd love to know if there are comparable figures for north coast of New South Wales beaches. But, you know, I mean, here we go. I mean, nothing changes from the 30s through to the 60s to today. You know, it's, it is just that great archetypal Australian site. That's how they... It, that's how they promote Australia, you know, sun, surf and sand, because that's what tourists come here for. That's how they see us. And that's what they say, well, that's what's different about Australia. Bribey. Who would have thought it? You know, how do you drown at Bribey? Five of them did. And again, all men. Mackay. Another place I would never get in the water now. I think, yep. Sharks up the, the Pioneer River. Okay. I suspect that there'll also be crocodile deaths in the Mackay area that I have not yet found. The furthest south crocodile fat fatality that, I, that is absolutely confirmed is Rockhampton. I think they could all, also come to Gladstone as well, but they're mostly Mackay North. Okay. You, know, you still drive your motor car right to the beach, okay? And it's still, still happening. And, I mean, really, it does give you an, an insight into how dramatically things have changed in the last 40 years and that that would all now be not high-rise but, you know, fairly big buildings alongside the waterfront. Oh, it keeps going. Malula Bar, yeah, another one we thought was safe. Kira, love that photo. I love the way the mountains. I don't think you can get rid of them. I'd say that they, uh, you know, some parts of that would still be the same. Of course, there's a huge debate at the moment because the Kira surf break has disappeared due to the sand pumping project on the Tweed, uh, an iconic surf destination no longer exists on the southern Gold Coast. So. What things like that do to long-term patterns is another thing altogether. So here they are. And, you know, 
Remember what I said at the beginning, the beaches with the most deaths are not necessarily the most dangerous, they're just the ones there are more people go to, therefore there are more drownings. Noosa. All right. I think that's pretty good. Um, one of those two at Noosa was a non-swimmer on a surfer plane, all right? One of the greatest menaces ever created. And she just went out and kept going, never seen again. Wynnum. A number of people said to me, how do you drown at Wynnum? <laughs> nice, calm, little muddy beach. Well, one boy did. Coolum, I reckon there's the beach to go for. Now, is that just because nobody went to Coolum up until 1960? I mean, don't forget that that coast road is only opened in the 1960s. So up until then, you didn't have access to a lot of those beaches. But Alexander Hedlund was probably open right from the early days. So that's not a bad one. In total, in that 70 year period, I have come across in the inquest and bearing in mind, you know, we're looking at hundreds of deaths every year, about 1,500 drownings, okay? That's across the board, beaches, rivers, creeks, waterholes. At least 60, I think it's higher. I, I think it's between 60 and 100. Now, given that I've looked at 50,000 inquests, you're pretty safe, really. Under 50 shark attacks, OK? And nearly all men. So the men stay out of the water, the women go swimming, you'll be right. But just don't go near Ross Creek. Okay? If you go to Townsville, stay in a pool, 10 stinger deaths. And again, they're all from Townsville North. Okay, overwhelmingly Cairns area, Mission Beach, and six documented crocodile deaths. There may well be more crocodile deaths. There's a lot of people disappear in areas that are known to be crocodile infested. And people say, yeah, yeah, we think a crocodile got them. Or a crocodile was seen in the area a week later. And that usually gives people the reason to blame a croc. But they you know, six that are absolutely confirmed that somebody actually saw the crocodile grab the person and eat them. And there's surfer planes. Just so in case you didn't know what they looked like. That's at Green Mount too, but um, I think those girls are still down there. I think I saw them there last week, still swimming, or their granddaughters. So that concludes Death at the Beach. I've stunned you all. None of you are going to ask questions now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. Are there any questions for Richard? Yeah, you're okay. Richard, they, um, once they named them after the ladies up there, there's been some research recently to show that they, a lot of them originate around the top of the Torres Strait Island and up into Indonesia and they follow the ocean currents down past Queensland. Do you think that what you said before about the agricultural products getting into the water, well, the same thing's happening up there. But it appears that there's a breeding area up there and they're following that current down. That would be right. Just, uh, sorry, just for the uh, benefit of the recording, the question is about the Irukandji jellyfish. Indonesians invading Australia. Just what we've always feared. By sea too, they're boat pests. Um, I don't know about that. Jamie Seymour at James Cook University is the stinger expert. He will know for sure. All I know is that stingers um, uh, come, you know, they're, they're brought south by northerly winds um, and all the research over the years has proven that north-facing V-shaped bays so the stingers get sort of washed by wind and current into these bays. Um, the worst one is in Mission Beach where Castaways Resort is built. I would never swim there ever, no matter what time of the year, because it, it's just a funnel to trap stingers and they actually got the biggest number of really stingers. It really surprises me that the Indigenous people 
really weren't greatly affected by them. Well, the, the most wonderful part about that is that there were stinger attacks recorded in Torres Strait, and I, I just almost didn't believe this. You know what Torres Strait Islanders do? If their children get stung, grab them by the feet and whack the child against a coconut tree and the shock restarts their heart and they survive. And I didn't believe, I thought, no, no, this is it. And actually medical experts said, yeah, yeah, it's just like a defibrillator but using a a palm tree. I don't know how hard they hit the the kid's head but that's actually documented. The other thing was the number of drownings that from the 1930s onwards. Do you think prior to that, in the late 1800s, there still wasn't a great deal of people who learned how to swim? Really, even though we have coast, such a large coastline, because of the long swimming, the Tanning Beach period for that long period of time, didn't we have a large proportion of the population who still didn't know how to swim when the beaches were suddenly open? That's a question that I've still to answer. Um, I'd love to, to take this further. I'd love to explore the swimming culture. You know, the seaside culture is one thing, but when did Australian children learn how to swim? We still get people arrive in Australia who do not know how to swim. One of the things that terrifies me, we have international students at Griffith University, Gold Coast, nearly every year one drowns because they can't swim, they don't know about beach safety, they ignore all the, the signs. Um, so I think that, you know, that's, that's a really important question and it's one I... But it's probably something I won't actually find in the archives. I've kept an eye out for it, but I certainly have not yet seen, unless there's something in the education department records, but all the school records I've seen say nothing about swimming classes. Elizabeth might know. No? Okay. Yes? Um, uh, my, my name's Paul. I spoke to you about six weeks ago prior to this. I, I'm a current lifesaver at Kings Beach and on the Stone Passage, Bullcock Beach. Mm-hmm. Um, the official line is that in the last hundred years, there has been no drowning by death between the flags. Mm. on any beach in mm. Australia. Mm. So, the last season just passed. Yeah. No one drowned on the Sunshine Coast yep. between the flags, um, despite many trying. Mm. Um, and regarding the, the swimming training, mm. as part of a book I've just finished on the 1896 Pearl disaster just out the frontier where 25 people drowned, bodies were washing up from Victoria Bridge to Gribey Island. Mm. Mm. Um, Many of the women in, in Victorian dress mm. were strong swimmers and saved mm. themselves. Mm. So mm. there was the Metropolitan Baths just over the road here, mm. Mm. Uh, opened in 1870, and they were learning to swim then. Mm. Mm. And the Royal Life Saving started in 1893 in Queensland, and Queensland was one of the, uh, the strongest take ups of life saving training. Mm. Um, it was then called the Rescue of the Apparently Drowned. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the people on that 1896 uh, disaster, a young girl was brought, not conscious, not breathing, onto Stanley Street mm. and revived in a sweet shop. Mm. Mm. So there's been a long and noble history of people mm. training and learning uh, mm. how to swim but, and rescue people. But, Paul, the inquests that I've seen would suggest that there have been drownings between the flags because in a number of those cases, lifesavers attempted to rescue people. Okay, not a, a big number. There's only a small number of cases. And that's one of the things that... One of the, the, the points of detail that I want to look again more closely at to say, OK, were they in between? Were there actually flags? And some of the correspondence I'm starting to find in the archives between local government and surf life-saving clubs suggest that every now and then there would be a rogue patrol who wasn't doing their job properly and promptly was sacked by the, the council. The um, definition is also in patrolled hours. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if people are swimming outside those hours... And like I say, I mean, 
I think I remember swimming in the dark as a teenager. You know, you just don't do it. You don't swim on your own. <laughs> you know, how many of these were people swimming on their own? I mean, the stu- the, it's the non-swimmers that just astonish me. But just again, just quickly, the, um, in 1949, on the Christmas weekend, mm. 49 people drowned in Australia. Mm. Yeah, you said that. The weekend. Yeah, so all down south. Uh, no, all around Australia. Yeah. But there was five of them drowned on Talabudgera. Yep, three oh, on okay. one day. Actually, it's funny you should say that. Oh, because we, had to research, <laughs> yes. we had to research that one. Yes. Um, and the bloke came in. Yeah. And I kind of noticed it because my cousin was on life saving duty. Mm-hmm. But he it was the first time he'd used the net. Mm. And he located it and asked us if we could find the images of it. Mm. His mm. brother was involved. Okay. I was actually staying in Columbia Fitness Camp then. Oh, we probably all got a link. <laughs> we, were made, yeah. we were made to go into the surf. Okay. Okay. Into the we well, that raises the important question: Why didn't I get it? Why wasn't there an inquest into that drowning? Now, in my experience, the only reason why deaths are missing from the inquest—don't forget—an inquest is a sudden, suspicious, or accidental death. Okay, they should all be there, but there are gaps in the in the files because there was a subsequent legal action involving those deaths. Was somebody prosecuted as a result of that, in which case it is in another part of the justice system? That's what I want to ask you about, John. Yeah, yeah, well, that's... I'm now, systematically, I'm up to 1887. I'm working through the inwards correspondence of the Justice Department. At the rate I'm going, sometime... Maybe this decade. <laughs> I'll get up to 1949. <laughs> oh, but not about the, it's not the 49 one, because obviously mm. we deal with a lot of this kind of stuff. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, there are two questions that, that I'm interested in. In 1864-65, something like that, a Captain Croft died when his vessel was shipwrecked around near Harvey Bay. And they knew he drowned. There's no death record of that. Mm, mm. Um, and the other one that's got me mm. is the vessel, the Lye Moon, which was a Queensland ship, was coming back from Victoria. And in May 1886, it was shipwrecked on um, Green Cape. 71 people died. Now, when you look at this, and there's only the index for New South Wales for that time, there are only three people on whom they conducted an inquest, but the person in, you know, I'm researching belonged to a very prominent family in Queensland, Stanley's, FDG Stanley, Henry, Henry Stanley. It was their sister. Now, her death's in the papers. Mm. Um, her body was identified because of a bracelet that had been given to her, but there is no death record. And it's, it's this issue, that mm. the, the gap between the known deaths... Yep and the death records and, of course, the other gap of the inquests mm, mm, that I'm interested in. Mm, Can you mm. explain that a bit further? Oh, no, I can't because I had a, um, a colleague from uni came to the archives yesterday. She was looking for a death and she's quite sure that this death took place but there's no record in the BDMs, there's nothing in the inquests. But see, these are very detailed reports um, and this is what surprises me. Can I? The clerical system is is imperfect. It's created by humans. Perfect. You know that. So, just having just finished this book on the curl, there were twenty five people known mm. to have drowned, mm. but only eleven death certificates that I found. Mm. Mm. Why? So because one of the possible we need things your is, is the right? police gave, and I found this certificates of burial yeah. to various people whose bodies were washed up two or three, four weeks later. Mm-hmm. Once they're identified, they gave them certificates of burial, but I haven't yet been able to find, as you say, death certificates. Yeah. I've yeah. done funerals for some of them, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. not for them. Well, see, in, in, in a case like that, they may, not, they may have made a decision not to hold an inquest because they knew the cause of death. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the primary purpose of the inquest, is to establish the cause of death. Okay? So if you already know, well, they drowned in a shipwreck, you don't need to hold an inquest. So why did they okay? hold All right, well, the person to ask is not here today, but it's Lee Butterworth, who's currently working on a history of the coroner's office in Queensland. 
the answer I suspect that Lee would give if she was here, and she would be able to answer that, it comes down to the foibles of the individual magistrate or JP or whoever. Whichever official, Queensland has this very haphazard system of law and order. So there was no now, when does it end is another good question, too. Is that what you're saying? There's no official procedure? Well, that's what she's actually discovered, that these people were sent out as magistrates or they were made into JPs and they're writing into the Justice Department saying, what do I do? And particularly when it comes to inquests, they say, I've never held an inquest. I don't have the proper forms. I don't know what to do. Can I bury the body? OK, there's a whole... We're finding masses of this stuff and it really does bring out that, you know, and it's a, you know, a really awful thing to say and don't any of you blame me for this. Queensland was talent poor. Okay? We did not have sufficiently qualified, experienced, educated people to administer everything in this state. Okay? Given that in the 1880s, half of the police magistrates, and don't forget they are the law in Queensland, half the police magistrates were former native police. Okay? Men who we know were serial killers. Men who participated in genocide. Okay? So half of them are rewarded for their circumspection by being given a cushy posting. Yet even then, I found a letter from WRO Hill written from Cairns saying, I've just been appointed as a police magistrate. I don't know how to do this. I haven't got a clue. I've had no training, no guidance. I've got no experience. And you can understand why there are letters being written. And you will find them in trove. The police magistrate is useless. He wouldn't even know how to hold a proper inquest. Okay. I wonder, in some respect, going further back in some of the shipwrecks, if it may not come down to a societal matter where quite a few of those people who drowned didn't matter, didn't count, their names weren't real, they might have been... No, that's sort of the case for Bathurst Bay. Okay. You all know about Bathurst Bay, don't you? The greatest civil disaster in Australian history, 400 men drowned, but 390 of them were Asian, so they don't okay. count. No, no inquest into those drownings. Not, not a sausage. Not even a, a marine investigation. Yeah, there's five Kanakas who died and nothing else. Just Only five. Birds, no, no. Oh, sorry, in this particular... Every second inquest I get is about the death of a South Sea Islander. It's a, the death, you know, of them from disease and an accident must have been just incredible. But, Jonathan, how do you explain someone like Alice Jennings. It's all over the papers. It's reported in the West Australian. Uh, prominent mm. family. Mm. Everyone knows it. Even her husband's mentioned all the connections in mm. Brisbane. They can identify her, but there's no death record. There's no inquest. Well, you need to... Uh, what year is that one? Um, 1886. Well, I should have come across her. No, but sorry. Although this was a Queensland ship, yeah. And she was coming back to Queensland. This happened at Green Cape, which is ah. just the Victorian border. Oh, no, no, no. Out of our jurisdiction. Sorry. <laughs> no, seriously, it really is. I, I have actually got... Um, you, you would have thought it was a joke. It was an accident just near Stanthorpe, but the person died in New South Wales. Do we have to hold an inquest? All right? So, you know, all those jokes about state borders, they're true. They really are. So terribly sorry, you're um, at sea is another whole grey area altogether. You're supposed to hold an inquest at the port that the ship arrived at. But if the ship didn't arrive, where do you hold the inquest? And back then they, they held it at Green Cape. But what, one of the interesting yep. things about it, um, Mary McKillop's mother was on that ship. <laughs> and they actually, that was the, the big deal. Although, as far as I'm concerned, it's, you know, obviously the person I'm chasing. But they took Flora McKillop's body back to Sydney. The others were buried at Green Cape. But um, she wasn't even the subject of an inquest. Have you looked in Victoria? Um, 
Well, I just sort of thought it would be New South Wales because they're buried in New South Wales and they died in New South Wales. Um, New South Wales. Now, I don't know this. I only hear this in the researcher community. They destroyed their inquest in the 1950s. We, because we've only got indexes. They said nobody's going to ever use these. What, what's the point of keeping all these old records about dead people? But we've got the indexes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. And, uh, you know, my understanding of Victoria is not much better. In fact, Victoria, they may still be out in the courthouses. Yeah, but I don't think it would be in Victoria. Yeah. Because that's not where it happened. Yeah, but it won't be here. No, I guess I'm just trying to make yeah. sense of why they select those three. Why, mm. when they can clearly identify mm. a body, mm. why, when somebody was quite important, We've got no death There's probably correspondence, but you will have to go to three different archives, and then on top of that, I would suggest you'd have to search the Admiralty as well. Joint copying project. Yeah, but this is a Queensland ship. Doesn't it's matter. No, nah, doesn't matter where the ship comes from. And it's a coastal. No, nah, doesn't matter. It's about whereabouts the fatality occurred, and that's what I mean. At sea, you're in a whole other area. You know, it depends how far off the shore. And, you're outside of the... Oh, uh, it's a nightmare. It yeah. I mean, one of the great comedies of Queensland inquest law is that you're not meant to hold an inquest without having cited the body to prove there actually was a death. What do you do with those shark attacks where the body was never found? How did they hold an inquest? There's nobody there. All they did is... He disappeared in the surf. We think a shark took him. You're supposed to produce the body. The policeman's manual says that. You cannot prove that a death has occurred until you've actually seen the body. And the guide to coroners says exactly the same thing. You must first produce the body. You know, somebody could just be... It could be an Agatha Christie. It was a Latin phrase they used to produce the body. I've forgotten. Sorry. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Habeas corpus, that's it. Habeas corpus. Yeah. So the yeah. so. corpus, we can't No, well, that's, that's what's so fascinating. That's what, you know, I mean, they had an um, inquest into Daniel Morecambe. There's no body. Um, no, no, the, the, the law has been changed, but for many, many years, you had to produce a body. So drownings, lost at sea, is probably one of those cases where they said... We're not obliged to hold an inquest. You've got to remember, governments don't like spending money and inquests cost money. Okay. So would the cause of death then be presumed drowned? You know, or you couldn't call it a cause of death? No, they'll just put drowned. Well, they do put drowned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all, you know, it is all funny, it really is, because, yes, there is no proof. It should say presumed drown. There's a whole set of protocols goes with inquests and it's all about protecting the living. Okay? It's almost about the inquest is actually done for the sake of the survivors. In particular, and I know this because of all the suicide cases I've looked at, it's to do with life insurance. Okay? A lot of life insurance companies would not pay out if they could possibly avoid it. So if you had contributed it in any way towards your death, okay, so drowning would be the very first question, well, what were you doing on the boat? What did you do to stop the boat from sinking? Okay, what were you doing in the water? You know, so you often get these open findings. Um, it's, I'm still learning. <laughs> Ten years down the track, I'm still learning how to match all this stuff up because I've actually realised that when an inquest arrives at the Justice Department, it gets streamed. Various parts of it go off to various different clerks. Okay. I wonder how many um, of the supposed drownings may have been shark attacks, but because the various councils and authorities who wanted to keep public perception to a different level, they would rather call it a drowning than a... Oh, hospital. six or one, half a dozen of the other. This is the Jaws syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, Daryl. I really don't know. 
Shall we wind it up? Oh, we should wind it up. Um, <laughs> can we have a round of applause for Jonathan? That was great. <laughs> Thanks uh, very much for coming, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll just uh, make a brief announcement. Um, next month, on the 4th of June, the John Oxley Library will be having an open day. That's a Saturday. Uh, all day where you can come up and have a look at the collections, hear some stories behind collections on display. And on the same day, the Royal Historical Society of Queensland will have an event here in this very room. Uh, it's a conference on Burke and Wills, so a lot of good reasons to visit here on the 4th. Explorers fourth. after Burke and Wills. Explorers after Burke and Wills. Thank oh, you, oh, yeah, that'll be good. And uh, mm. also, of course, the next out of the port will be the third Wednesday of June, same time, same place, and that will be Carol Lowe. Uh, talking about her work on the Prejudice and Pride exhibition that the Museum of Brisbane put on last year. So thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.